Nigerians face tough times as inflation soars to seven-year high. Today on the program, we'll be looking at the implications. Also, Nigeria spends over 99% revenue to service debts as inflation bites even harder. We also will be looking at what the headlines on some of our national dailies are this morning on Off the Press. Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on the program. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's a midweek and so we call it a midweek frenzy. We do hope that since you have survived from Monday till this moment, you are going to have a very, very terrific uh, rest of the week. Uh, that means Thursday, Friday will also be good. This is a big week and we're hoping that it's going to be a wonderful day for you. Thanks for joining us on the program. We do hope that what we're going to discuss will impact on your life and those people that really matter will get to listen to us and do the needful because Nigerians uh, are really, really, really crying. Today we're focusing on inflation, what the implications of this inflation uh, is to our economy and to family life and to every aspect of our life lives in Nigeria here today. So we'll have those two segments where we will be uh, discussing infl inflation uh, from two different angles. Well, we move on to our top trending issues for today. And on the top trending uh, matters uh, today, uh, we're looking, first of all, at a fuel price that has climbed to 617 naira per litre. That's in Abuja and some other states. But in Cross River State, as I said yesterday, some filling stations were selling for 700 naira. And I'm sure that some other places in Nigeria are also doing that. The price of petrol has increased. Uh, to about 6.17 per litre. That is uh, almost like official price at this moment. And reports show that the fuel price had been adjusted from 539 Naira to 617 per litre. The increase could be connected to the recent projections by oil marketers that fuel, uh, the price of fuel will hit 700 Naira per litre uh, soon. Okay, so everybody has been saying that this is maybe likely going to be what it's going to be. And around 600 Naira, it was bought around 600 Naira in Lagos. And once independent marketers start importing the products from July, a lot of people are hoping that it's going to come down. But their predictions, or that's about the independent marketers, their predictions were based on the current high exchange rate, crude price and landing cost. So now it's 617. And they... Uh, boss of the NNPCL said that it is not the fault of NNPC at all that it is the market forces that are doing this. The Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria, that is IPMAN, an association of distributors and uh, transporters of petroleum products, the DTOP, uh, have denied plans to increase petrol price to 700 naira per litre. But what is happening right now? Um, uh, they're the ones increasing it. Uh, they are now blaming it on uh, the market forces. The associations, in an interview with the news agency of Nigeria, dismissed reports of the alleged increase of pump price as speculations uh, or as speculated by the public. They said fuel price was being driven by market forces and given the current high exchange rate, the pump price of premium motor spirit, PMS, that we call petrol, could increase, hence the prediction. So. It is not their fault. Whatever happens, if we buy fuel for 1,500 Naira, it is market forces doing it. During his inaugural speech, if you remember, on May 29, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu announced the removal of fuel subsidy, leading to the increased price of petrol from 195 to 540 Naira per litre overnight. Nigerians have been lamenting the effect of subsidy removal on their lives, but the Tinubu administration has promised relief. Last week, uh, when he hosted the class of 1999 governors, Tinubu appealed for more patients from Nigerians. He assured Nigerians that a framework for palliatives to remedy the effects of fuel subsidy removal was being worked out. Now, uh, we have had his uh, 
um, man on communication and strategy uh, telling us uh, that is Delia Lucky uh, telling us that um, these plans are, are going to be unveiled uh, very very soon and it's not only the 8,000 Naira that is promised vulnerable Nigerians uh, that is uh, the palliative the palliative includes a lot of things that will be done for Nigerians and we keep asking was it really uh, of benefit to Nigerians that this fuel subsidy was totally removed uh, who is really benefiting now that the fuel subsidy that we were told over the years that it was a scam uh, has been removed? So who is benefiting now? Is it the people or uh, the government? And if the government is benefiting, which should have meant that there was more money to be spent on the people, is that money reaching us? It, it, is 8,000 enough? And if it is enough, how long will it take? Six months? Is six months enough? Are they saying that when you have this 48,000 or so that will be paid to you in six months, your life will be so much better that you have no reason to complain about the fact that uh, transportation has increased, um, food items have increased, everything else has increased? Is it, is it the 8,000 that is going to take care of Nigerians? And actually, does Nigeria not have money at all, like we are complaining, when the members of the National Assembly are buying bulletproof cars or are trying to buy bulletproof cars for more than 200 million naira each? When they are going to have palliatives, uh, the money for the palliatives, 500, out of 500,000 or 500 million, they are going to have about 70, uh, 500 billion rather, they are going to have about 70 billion shared among themselves where every senator or House of Reps member is going to be getting maybe like 10 million per month for palliatives in the country where everybody is asked to tighten their uh, belts. Well, that is left for the Nigerians uh, to to, to think about. Maybe we have to have a rethink about this fuel subsidy removal, especially now that we know that the figures have come really, really drastically down. So if we were spending 100 billion every month, and now we know that we can spend only 30 billion and we'll still have enough fuel for Nigeria and Nigerians, why don't we rethink it? Everybody was clapping that fuel subsidy was removed. But now that we're seeing the impact of the removal of fuel subsidy, was it really a wise decision? Well, people who make the decisions are going to tell us more. And we do hope that everything should be uh, because of Nigerians and for the welfare of Nigerians. For now, we have not seen that. Then the second uh, top trending is the fact that in the prisons, in the correctional center, in the custodial center, five inmates of the Kuje Custodial Center have earned university degrees in various disciplines at the National Open University of Nigeria. I feel like clapping uh, for that. That is the Kuje that some others were breaking out of and some of them went straight back into crime. Now, during the presentation of certificates to the graduations in a, uh, grad graduates rather in Abuja, uh, there was um, on Monday, July 17th, the Controller General Nigerian Correctional Service, Haliru uh, Nababa, said education was a potent means of rehabilitation. He was represented by the Controller of Corrections, FCT Command, Ibrahim Idris Nababa, expressed uh, confidence that the inmates could compete favorably with their counterparts without stigmatization. He said education is transformative and a powerful rehabilitative tool for development in every society. Therefore, with these certificates, they are fit to compete anywhere without being stigmatized. And like I said, it's, it's a very laudable thing. It's very, very commendable that the Correctional Center gave the opportunity to these people. And I thank the former president, uh, Lucia Goma Basinjo, who brought the Open University of Nigeria so that people like these could also take advantage and be educated. But I must also ask, add, sorry, that not everybody can be in prison and get a certificate. Some people didn't even go to school while they were out, uh, let alone uh, being able to read while they are in the university to get degrees. Some people can do that, but not everybody can do that. And that's why the government provided um, facilities to train these people, some of them to become carpenters, some of them to become tailors, some of them to become hairdressers, as the case may be. But if you go into the prisons, I do not know whether there are some prisons that still have these facilities, but I do know that the, pro the government provided these facilities at some point to very many prison centers or correctional centers, uh, as the case may be. But 
these things are not available anymore. You go to the prisons, you don't find toothpaste for the inmates, you don't find a, even a hammer for someone to learn how to become a carpenter or a clipper, for someone to learn how to be a, um, a barber or a, or a dryer, for someone to learn how to be a, a hairdresser or something like that. All those things are missing. Who? has been taking them. Is it the inmates themselves that now uh, take those things away or the warders or the people that should ship those things to the prisons do not bring them and they sell them off? We do not know what happens. But in Nigeria, some of the things that happen negatively, I think it's just a matter of, uh, a matter of, um, uh, of uh, monitoring. We do hope that so many things will be done by this present administration and make sure so, well, so we do hope that everything will be monitored so well that nobody gets to get away with any kind of crime. You're taking care of people that you want to remove from society so that crime will not be committed, and then you are committed, committing crimes against them. Some people are there only awaiting trial. I've, I've, I know somebody who stayed for seven years in prison awaiting trial. And if that person comes out, you know that first thing he will think about is that the, the state has failed him, the institution has failed him, the government has failed him, the country has failed him. And if he goes into crime, yes, you will blame him that he should have known better, but you will also blame the people that made him become a criminal when he was not supposed to. And this person I'm talking about that stayed seven years uh, awaiting trial in a prison was coming back from work. And maybe somehow people committed a crime somewhere and ran away, and they just bundled him into prison. He stayed seven years. What do you think that kind of a person will come out to be? But I'm very glad that these people have made it. They have had certificates. And it is difficult for someone who is so educated and has had a degree, even when in the correctional center, to come out and become a criminal again. He's already um, empowered enough to be self-reliant enough not to go back into crime. So we should encourage this a, a lot. So maybe even the people who didn't have the opportunity to go to primary, secondary school, and they are now in prison. In prison, it's a, it's a level playing ground, as, as it were. So we should encourage more people to get educated, while, even while in prison, so that when they come out, they'll be more confident in themselves. They'll be more uh, bold to do a lot of things that they need to do, and they will think better when it comes to the fact that they're tempted to do something. Someone said some, somewhere that an educated ma person is, is not fit to be a slave. Something like that is a paraphrase. That's not the exact word. But he said, if you're educated, it's difficult for someone to enslave you. And it's difficult for yourself to even enslave yourself by thinking that you're a no good uh, person. You cannot be anything more than just a criminal. But these people have put in their effort. They now have a certificate. So congratulations to them. Congratulations to the people who made it possible for them to do this. Congratulations to the correctional center, uh, Kujie Correctional Center. Even though we were very angry that when the people broke out, at the time they broke out, in some sections of the prison, there were no CCTV cameras, there were no things that could have helped us identify these people or make sure that we know that something is being, a crime is being committed, people are trying to break out. The security was sort of porous, but now we still say thank you uh, to them. So education should be encouraged. If that is the only thing that people can go into the prisons and get, it's, it should be encouraged. But we shouldn't wait for the time where people go into a prison or a correctional center before they will have the time, they will have the, the opportunity to go to school. I'm saying this because when, for instance, some people were abducted by Boko Haram, the Chibok girls the, the, and other people that were abducted, the people that were now rescued, some of them were sent abroad. Do we always need to have a disaster before we do what we need to do? Can't Nigerian uh, government give scholarships to a lot of people, more people than they are giving now, because I'm sure that they're giving to a few people, uh, more people than they're giving now. Why not? Why wait until someone is abducted when you rescue the person because you want to rehabilitate the person and you want to show that uh, the government has a human face? You send that person abroad to go and study and all that. The colleagues of these people who stayed back, who were not abducted, who were still in school, do not even have the opportunity. Some of them may have dropped out because of maybe 
a few nairas here and there, and then you're waiting for disaster for you to be able to help somebody. I don't think that is a very good thing, but you know, that's my opinion. Don't wait for disaster before a Nigerian can be helped. Now, subsidy is going off from everything, including uh, fuel, including education, including health, including almost like everything. But we are not the only country subsidizing things. So if one way of subsidizing doesn't work, why not we look inward and see how we can make it better and monitor it better. But that's just my opinion. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at the headlines on Off the Press. Stay with us.